Welcome everyone to the second annual SSF Con. Um, you're in the uh, creative track, um, creating an alien civilization. I'm C.W. Lamb. Uh, I've been writing for about uh, six years. And I do science fiction, fantasy, and a couple of other odd and uh, extraneous things. Uh, SJ? Hi, I'm SJ Shower. I'm the writer of the Spiral War Saga that uh, has recently been picked up by Dawn Runner Press, the runners of this. And I've been writing on and off since I was a kid, but published for about the last 10 years. Lawrence? Hi, I'm Lawrence M. Schoen. Uh, I may be the old man on this panel in that I started selling fiction 30 years ago uh, and and have been picking up sp a lot of speed in the last couple of years. Uh, just put out my 31st book, I think, which staggers my mind. I mostly nowadays write uh, light humorous science fiction, uh, but I'm a hybrid author. Uh, and a I had some books out from Tor but in the last five years that are more heavy philosophy, uh, your grandfather's science fiction, as it were. Shalina? Hi, everybody. I'm Shalina. I might be the baby in the group. Um, I started publishing in 2017, and I write primarily young adult fantasy and space opera sci-fi. Uh, most of everything I write is family friendly in, in, in honor of the sci-fi that I grew up with. And um, I'm currently living in Canada, but I have lived on a few other continents. And Alan. Hello from Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we are many miles away, but uh, it is early evening here. I'm Alan Stroud. Uh, I'm chair of the, the British Science Fiction Association, and I, I write at the moment, I write Military SF, which uh, appears to have gone rather well, because uh, uh, Flame Tree Press rather like uh, my series with Fearless, uh, which is about a, a disabled protagonist and a, a ship duel. Uh, but before that, um, I was known for writing fantasy uh, and for writing science fiction, and my PhD is in uh, science fiction and fantasy world building for computer games. Awesome. So the uh, panel today is uh, specifically around creating an alien civilization uh, as described from uh, language to culture to biology. This panel will explore considerations related to creating interesting and unique aliens, which we all hope that's what sells books. Um, <laughs> what are some of the key things to keep in mind when designing an alien race? Um, I we we kind of passed some ideas around uh, before the the panel uh, began, and so uh, I'll kind of throw the floor open. Does somebody feel really strongly about one particular yes, thing? Yes. Go ahead, Lawrence. <laughs> so, so my doctorate's in psycholinguistics, basically, and and just to get it out there, I'm the founder and director of the Klingon Language Institute, <laughs> uh, the people who restored Hamlet to its original language. So, alien language. Yeah, don't don't give me that <laughs> look, SJ. Uh, alien language. That's why I had to get this out at the beginning. So, a alien language representation in in science fiction is obviously a pet peeve of mine. And while I I don't like the the universal translator, which I have built into this ballpoint pen as a device, I'd rather see that than see people mangle attempts at language. But what when I'm creating an alien civilization, and I'm at least making a nod toward they don't talk like we do. I want the full range of it. So when, when the aliens show up and they speak, you know, I don't know, let's call the language Bosco. Mm -hmm. I want not just the shiny captain who comes down the steps with the perfect, what with what Alan might know as the British received pronunciation version of Bosco, <laughs> the high prestige dialect. I also want to hear how the, the the guy who's scouring the pans in, in the galley speaks the language. I want to hear what the Bosco equivalent of speech impediments and 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 speech errors and and old dialects and and dead metaphors and euphemisms that the previous generation used but you can't use now because they're socially unacceptable. I want the full range and splendor of language. Not just what you know we get on the nightly news 
uh, from from a broadcaster because that's that's the cleaned up version that they send to meet with world leaders. Well, let me ask you about that specifically because when I, when I'm writing and in particular you're introducing uh, a new alien culture, there's so many aspects of it, but the language as you described. You could damn near write a book just on the language piece. Yeah, you know, where let's have <laughs> Where do you draw well, that line and try to balance well, you you know, know, all you know, the I, other aspects? I, I had someone, uh, a reviewer, look at, at, at uh, my first novel and, and said, this really isn't science fiction. He, Lawrence doesn't explain, you know, how the, 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 the ship moves through across the across the galaxy and all this and they said you know my protagonist is a stage hypnotist he doesn't know how the ship works any more than i know how my car works you know i know i have to put fuel in it once upon a time i could change spark plugs but i think the car has evolved beyond my knowledge to even do that now so that's not necessary for me to drive the car and it's not necessary for my protagonist unless my protagonist is a starship captain or an engineer to know how those things work uh, and and the reader should glom onto that, but but for to to carry this back to what you're talking about. So in 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 um in some one of, some of my series, there is a trade tongue spoken by different races of the galaxy, and it's called Traveler. And in one of the novels, the protagonist, to his amazement, discovers there are there is more than just one trade tongue in other parts of the galaxy. They don't speak Traveler; they speak something called Spoto. Because they haven't gotten around to this part of the galaxy where we speak traveler. And just the idea that you could have multiple trade tongues opens up that concept. And that's enough for the reader to, to make the language part of the storyline. You're acknowledging that, that elephant in the room. You, but you, you're not going to cook it because, you know, it takes too long to carve it up and make sandwiches. <laughs> but, but you're acknowledging that it's an issue. You've, you've paid lip service to it to the extent that the characters in your story would acknowledge it. So there. Serena? Yes. I would. I would agree with that. I would. Agree. I, I would definitely agree with that. I would Should say. We... I would say for as an interpreter of language, um, I I abhor how easily accessible language is supposed to be in the future, um, when we can't even cover the planet we're on. Um, that neither here nor there. Uh, I come from that perspective when I Google write. Google Translator. No, I hate to tell you, boys. I hate to tell you, it ain't that good. It ain't even, not even close. I'm not out of a job yet. I'm not out of a job yet. Um, but I love making that a part of the story. I like the fact that they can't communicate. I actually thrive on characters who have languages that the translator doesn't pick up, and it sounds funny when you hear it through the translator, and it doesn't quite work anyway, and you still need to have someone else help you. Those are like the basis of some of the best comedy and fodder that happens to my characters in the story. So I, I, I bring that in and welcome it. It's well, all plot. It's, it's an opportunity. You either play it for laughs, you know, he wants my sister, what? Or, or you, you play it for, for drama because somebody Absolutely. has said the wrong thing and, and now we go to war. Yeah, uh, I actually did that in a fantasy series where in book one, the, the main character is transported through the storyline and he magically is able to speak language. Sweet. Well, in, yeah, in book three, through some other machinations, both he and the characters he interacted with in that other realm were dropped back on Earth and the language doesn't work anymore. So now you have people who are actually used to communicating with one another dropped into modern society here on earth with no ability. And so I'm, you know, I'm going through Rosetta Stone software image. I'm actually, to, to your point, Shalina, was researching um, uh, translators that use images instead of language to try to learn to for these characters to communicate to one another so i, I completely understand how you can make that twist and, and carry it through to your story alan you look like you're getting ready to burst out there, there. You got <laughs> <laughs> no I, I mean i was i was gonna say i mean i, I obviously I, I i concur with the the point that was made in that um you know this is a this is an opportunity for a story you know and there are many in science fiction, there are many things that um, that we have opportunities to explore 
that are plot points, you know, are things that we could we could make a, a challenge in the nature of uh, the story that we're in. And there are many examples of writers who have conveniently, uh, and you've just volunteered yourself, obviously, in that first book, <laughs> who have conveniently gone, oh, I don't want to worry about that. I'll just mm -hmm. I'll just have a thing, you know, uh, in terms of, of what's there. And that's, you know, that, that can be executed well. It can also be executed badly. Mm -hmm. And people can go, wait a minute. You know, how come how come they all understand each other? And of course, as soon as you get to that question, as soon as that question starts to, to percolate in the reader's mind, then you're, you're out of the story, really. You know, it's, it's a question that's taking you out of the text. Um, and I think we, we as modern writers have got to, to be very careful here in that mm -hmm. our readers are, you know, the, the global knowledge of um, the world is becoming you know, more advanced. And I, I usually use as my example here, um, uh, Spitfires in space, uh, you know, in the, you know, the use of gravity or, or can you hear sound? You know, why can we hear the engines? Why can we hear the engines when it's flying over us? Why can we hear the engines? You know, I use things like that as, as examples because, you know, cinematically we kind of <laughs> accept it, you know, it's, it's a suspension of disbelief. But the point here is that with language, actually, all of the fundamental building blocks of what we understand as a language that we, you know, we can share are derived from a bunch of other building blocks that were derived from an another bunch of building blocks and another bunch of building blocks. Mm -hmm. And if you then take a completely alien civilization and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, it's kind of similar to Finnish or, or um, they sound a little bit like, um, I don't know, uh, like... Like they're Going from, <laughs> yeah, you know, but it, it doesn't, it isn't a thing, you know, that's, that's, that's just it. The basis yeah. is probably going to be different. So uh, I do think pictorial study is incredibly important. Finding, and it's a real challenge, finding basic ways to communicate with somebody who does not understand you at all or has no, no common cultural basis with you in the slightest is actually really, really hard. And you do end up going back to some visuals. Um, you know, what do those visuals mean? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this gesture. Anyone familiar with that gesture? No? You mean like as in India or it's, as? It's, Bulg it's in Bulgaria. Now, um, you know, I've, I've been to Bulgaria several times and I, I clearly, I've, I've not been recently, so I'm now confused um, as to whether it means yes or no. <laughs> but it is one of those. <laughs> and the other one is, is you know, is a nod or a shake of the head. But that mm -hmm. is yes or no in Bulgaria, mm -hmm. you know. And, and mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't even realize mm -hmm. unless you see someone doing it, you know, in terms of what's there. Well, it's, so, it's, the, it's the body language argument. It's the first contact argument of, you know, how, how do you get around that communication thing? And I recently read the new Andy Weir book. And I don't want to give away any spoilers, but that's no a big spoilers big plot of, part of it is, you know, figuring these things out. And it's a good example of what we're talking about in every way, I think. Um, and you, you hear a lot in a lot of science fiction that they talk to the common language. What's the common language of the universe? Math. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm an engineer by trade. Mm -hmm. So I, that is one of the things I tend to fall back on. But at the same time, I sit there and say, well, there's so much differences in math. And especially when you're trying to figure out what different numbers mean. And I hearken back to a Wing Commander book <laughs> from the old Wing Commander video game series where they actually get into the head of the enemy at one point, And they're a base eight species. They don't use base 10 math. So I understand how to go from base eight to base 10 fairly easily. But if somebody is a linguist who doesn't have the math background to sit there and say, okay, five eighths of something, what, what are they talking about? You know, that's 40, you know, for somebody who's, who's base 10. So that got me thinking of, well, why would they be base eight? And the only thing I could keep coming back to was these things. Yeah. How many fingers do they have? Start you know, counting your thumbs. So the biology leads to the language, leads to the math, leads to culture. Yeah, language. I was going to say that. Biology is, yeah. takes, takes a huge part, too, because if you don't have the same physiological features, how can you make the same sounds? How can you, you know, once again, you, you come back to that same piece about how language is developed. It just doesn't necessarily cross. 
I want to float an idea that the reason we have television is not because it's a way to sell, you know, pork chops or potato <laughs> chips, but that it was a, a gre- an early agreement by that shadow world government <laughs> to send signals out into space. <laughs> so as the aliens come to us, they can hear how we sound. They can learn about our speech patterns and learn, you know, don't tell mother-in-law jokes and, mm. and on and on like this. When <laughs> so they actually still on arrive. I, feel like I, mean, go, I feel like we need to go back to that. What do you mean it's not for pork chops and chips? <laughs> I'm slightly I'm called sorry. out by that. Not I'm primarily. But the, okay. the purpose of television is not to monetize it, but actually to prepare us for, you know, Training the aliens who are coming our way with their superior technology. Who knew? Who knew that and, the Lumio brothers were secretly <laughs> were part of this this nefarious? So project. ahead of themselves. <laughs> yeah, but even then, you have to figure: Do they know how to translate the television signal into something that they can modulate I mean, and view? Exactly. Exactly. The <laughs> there, there is. Well, there, I mean, that's, that's that's an excellent point. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long it's, way to come. It's funny it, it's, you bring that up because. In, in, in my uh, primary series, one of the things I did with the aliens is the aliens don't speak. They biologically transmit and receive radio waves. Mm-hmm. So rather than using this audio mechanism that we use to communicate and to listen, their biological capabilities of communication are, are completely something that we would stand there and stare at them because we don't have the ability to receive those uh, transmissions. But you've, you've got two, you ever- two issues there. You've got uh, the first issue is that um, the one that you're, you're essentially that you're, you're, you're presenting, which is, is an excellent way of looking at, uh, at things in that um, we, what we know, we assume that others know. And so mm-hmm. thereby, um, circumventing that and, and deciding, okay, well, there's you know there's a different basis here, so there's a different basis to explore, and and the story is perhaps part of the clash between the basis of uh, of human knowledge and the assumptions of humanity compared to the assumptions mm. of of the alien race. But the second challenge, and this is the tricky bit, is knowing that your reader is coming from the basis of those human assumptions, mm-hmm. and thereby making the alien relatable to your reader enough that they can kind of anthropomorphize it a little bit so that they can get a kind of glimpse understanding or some kind of uh, connection with the the creature that you're you're putting across but also understand the difference in uh, the similar way and that you know that's the challenge of all writers and I think I mean Adrian Tchaikovsky, if people haven't read Adrian Tchaikovsky, I heartily recommend Adrian Tchaikovsky's uh, Children of Time series. He is a friend. Um, you know, we've known each other for many years, but the fact that he can create civilizations of spiders that seem mm-hmm. articulate, intelligent, and you know, and 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 more advanced than humanity, civil uh, civilizations of octopi uh, that uh, that have a completely different cultural basis to to, to humans, but again, are able to rival mm-hmm. humans within his work. I, you know, I mean, when, when you can kind of start to do that, and then he creates an entirely um, different alien civilization that, that again steps beyond that is is incredible work. Yeah, I didn't quite go that deep. I met him more humanoid, but changed the communication piece. Uh, that was, you know, we I actually had an idea when we were talking earlier, and it's something that occurred to me. So SJ and I are technical. We're both engineers. You guys are all linguistic, academic types. We need to get together and we could build this holistic story that would be balanced so well. <laughs> you know, well, I think that is you you hit the nail on the head. Uh, sorry, Larry. Um, it's it's balance. How do you balance the story and what you're trying to say? Because like we've said, you could write an entire story just about figuring out the language, just about figuring out the math, just fig- figuring out how to communicate uh, the the notion of communications differences resulting in war. Uh, one of the ones I hearken back to is Tim Zahn's Conquerors trilogy, where they basically had a biological quantum entanglement communication system, but our radio waves killed them. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, our primary means of communication is hurting you. 
and it's them trying to figure out how to get around that, but it leads to to war. So yeah. how do we, you know, deal with that? I think the great conundrum here and the great challenge for, for those of us who are, who are writing science fiction and want to present the alien is if something is truly alien, we're not going to be able to comprehend it because that's what it means to be alien. Mm -hmm. So you want to go that far and then pull back just a little bit so it seems weird and otherworldly, but you can still follow it. Uh, I, 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 I think if and when we truly meet the aliens... And they may already be here. And because they're alien, we can't grok them. We can't perceive them. We can't even, you know, my God, they're in the room here with me right now. <laughs> the uh, thing. And, mm -hmm. and the, the trick is, you know, to go almost all the way and then step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I and would I even, oh, sorry, go ahead, Larry. I would just want to mention CW... Have you read Ralph Milne Farley's The Radio Man books from 1925? No, but I think I should. <laughs> I think you should. I think I think I think you may owe him some money. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but see what was interesting about this, and part of the reason why I structured the story that way. This is one of those typical things we find a crashed uh, alien ship in the Arctic, blah blah blah. But all the bodies are dead. Why are the bodies dead? Well, they entered our atmosphere in the radio waves that surround the planet from our the artificial generation literally killed them. Uh, in fact, I had to go into a uh, whole detailed explanation, SJ will appreciate this, about the going to the digital frequencies with the multi-spectrum. Yeah. You know, just, <laughs> yeah, just basically fried their brains. So I, I can guarantee that a lot of that wasn't there in 1923. But well, sure, sure. Uh, so, Selena, you were, you were I was just going to add to what Lawrence was saying about mm -hmm. the the concepts of the the aliens themselves being alien and one of the things that as a as a person who deals with in multicultures is that's my goal is to try yeah. to figure out how these people are more alike than they are different by emphasizing what is different about them in the beginning and then showing how despite the language despite their physical appearance that they may at their heart or whatever's inside be very similar to us and 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 my goal with that is to like was mentioned earlier, is to have a place for my readers to come in and connect with not just the humans in the story or, or the Terrans or whatever uh, is mm -hmm. most like them, but also these other alien species that might be somewhat similar in, in behavior. Yeah, that's one say... of the things in my latest book that um, they meet a species that's extremely alien. It's an extremely high grav alien species for and everything about them is different, but you know, there's enough biological similarities. But one of the things the captain specifically asked the medical officer is, where do I look when I'm talking to them? Where are their eyes? Yes. <laughs> because he's a hunter, he's a predator. So he mm. wants to be able to look everybody in the eyes. And she's like, oh, well, they don't have traditional eyes. Mm. And basically their eyes are basically turned inside out with all the rods and cones and such exposed. And he's like, she's like, well, you kind of look here, but there is no specific place to look because they have full 360 vision. So it's like, yeah, just don't even try. <laughs> I mean, that's that's one of the ways in which science fiction can obviously be used to to sort of look at modern society and, and, and view it through a different prism. Um, I mean, there's also... There's some fascinating, you know, sort of explorations. Um, Octavia Butler's Blood Child, I think, oh, is yeah. is just an incredible exploration of, sure. of how you establish a symbiotic culture and you um, you kind of make it chilling, <laughs> you know, really chilling, really, you know, it, it, it is not, you know, it's it, it's not billed as being traditionally scary, but when you try to, you know, I'm trying not to spoil it for anyone that's not read it, but if you try to to then, you know, kind of imagine and envisage what's being talked about, it's just horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also, and I'm I'm going to kind of um, put a put a little uh, uh, a little um, blow a little bugle for um, the uh, not explaining. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, alien civilizations are, are useful for within science fiction is that you, 
you don't have to uh, to necessarily go into all of the detail of, of what they are and what they, they can be. It might be that as a plot point, they don't end up um, completely understood by the reader and that mystery remains within the reader's mind for the reader to speculate. Exactly. And that, you know, I think I'm probably gonna spend uh, this weekend making that point in a few different contexts because I'm a big, <laughs> I'm a big Robert, Robert Holstock fan uh, I like my mythology and I like my, my kind of myth making, you know, mm -hmm. and actually aliens are, are something that you can you can continue to intrigue people with because they are a romantic icon of science fiction. You know, people are, are continually, you know, speculating as to I wonder what it will be like, you know, if we met something like that. And um, there's something to be said for that kind of distance, like let there be some distance for the reader, mm. you know, between the themselves and the alien so that they have something to think about. Later. I love that point. So my, my guys, I, I was going to, I was going to say, I've got two, two examples of, um, of aliens. So I've got one book that I, I, the reality jumped the shark in that uh, I wrote a, a novel of, called Jud Judgment Earth which is about an alien coming to earth to eradicate humanity, to save the planet for everything else. And um, he comes to earth as a single molecule because that's how he travels incredibly fast through space and then acquires all this mass that he converts into his blueprint of what he is and then becomes uh, you know, sort of chameleon-like and so on and so forth. And that just because the perspectives on that were, were the perspective of the humans, but then also the perspective of the alien. And writing that perspective was just so challenging to, to kind of flip it all around and think of a way to make it distinctly dissonant. Something that I think Anne Leckie does incredibly well, by the way. Sure. Um, obviously not quite the same context with ancillary justice, but anyone that can make you feel that um, it's weird to be in one body rather than several thousand bodies, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's obviously is doing, doing everything right. And then the the guys I'm currently working with, the the aliens I'm working with in Fearless, I've I've explained nothing other than they seem to be able to manipulate gravity in a way that people can't manipulate gravity, and that's that's all people know at this stage, you know. So, you know, you 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 don't necessarily, you know, there, there is some, and I think there is absolutely a, a you know a, a sort of a reason to have them have kind of um, human imprint. Um, certainly in Judgment Earth, if I ever finish it, uh, uh, if I ever finish it, the, the alien does eventually, <laughs> yeah, the alien does eventually become a, you know, become very, I, almost falls in love with human society um, because uh, it witnesses the, the positivity of human society. But you don't have to necessarily go there and, and, and sort of take all that on board. Well, let me pause real quick because we're about halfway into this um, and we've obviously spent a significant amount of time on this communication language interaction aspect. Are, are there other things that we might want to? Uh, I was going to say, I was going to say there, um, I noticed with Alan and myself as well, and I think SJ um, might, might be able to speak to this too, but something about having um, an alien civilization, an alien species where there are individuals that are not the status quo. So they have disabilities, they have something that they lack that the rest of their uh, species has. Um, and I think um, I've played with that uh, in my books quite a few times. A lot, of, a lot of my characters, a lot of my main characters have a something about them that they can't do that everyone else can do, but they have something else that makes them okay. You well, know, makes them you, a little better, would, <laughs> but not well, the same thing. When you do that, though, are you applying it as a negative or necessarily a positive? No, it's it's more like it is what it is. Because in society, mm -hmm. it is what yeah. it is. I mm -hmm. walk around looking like I do because I am who I am, and there's nothing mm -hmm. I can do about that. And it's the same for my characters. They don't they don't sh they don't feel shame about the fact that they might not be the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. They don't walk around with that. It's it's not that kind of story. My stories are very positive, uplifting, but they do have something that makes them a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that looks like disability in some cultures. Um, but I, I like to play around with that concept and show that they can do usually quite, quite equally the same, if not more. What I like in something like that is you take that idea and you show it for more than one side of the equation. 
uh, I have a book coming out in 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 four days. Um, <laughs> four days. Four, four days. days. <laughs> I'm Turn sorry. Basic eight. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, five. Three, eight. eight. We're back to that binary thing. <laughs> Is this That's base right. eight? I can't do that kind of math. I'm just tell you right the now. Devil's thumb. Right now. Uh, <laughs> we you you ha you have two species sharing a planet. One thinks that they are a servitor race to the others and the other race says, man, we got to get these people out on their own feet. And, mm -hmm. and, and this has been going on for, for hundreds of millennia until my protagonist shows up to help them out. Um, and until you get, and we're back to communication. How do you get that across? Because it's always been this way. And, and then you, you roll in a biological explanation for why it's always been that way. And, and people are stuck in the ruts and even having the, the, the metacognition, the awareness that, oh, it's this way because of X. Well, if X is a biological factor that's built into your DNA or what passes for DNA, uh, there's not necessarily a hell of a lot you can do about it. Uh, but, but I like showing different sides of, of, of the same situation, a different perspective. But that's so me. Mervyn, Mervyn Peake was incredibly good at, at showing up the, the kind of allegorical sense of, you know, of ritual society trapped within itself, um, continually redoing the things that it was supposed to do every time and losing the meaning of, uh, of what was there in the first place. Um, I, I kind of think as well that, that Shalina's point about the, the kind of showing the difference um you know it, it sort of relates to a wider point in popular culture at the moment uh related to certainly in role-playing games we're seeing questioning of of biodeterminism in role-playing games you know this idea that elves are always slightly more intelligent and slightly slightly more dexterous and dwarves are, are apparently are, are always a little bit stronger or bigger constitution or, or whatever so you know the whole point here of of that has it, it actually, even though it's a tiny thing and, and you know, and, and sort of people go, okay, well, I'm playing a game. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's this, this, and this, but it actually imprints a framework. It imprints a framework directly onto the way in which certain qualities, certain traits are perceived. Um, and our stories imprint ways in which some of those traits and those qualities are perceived. And if you, you know, if you keep, if you keep dripping, then eventually you fill a bucket. You know, uh, eventually people people have got a whole bucket of water and they go, oh, well, actually, that must be the way it is. You know, and they, you know, they go and use the use the water and, you know, and uh, whatever else. But the, the point here is, is that actually showing the difference indicates that it's not always like that. And if we, you know, if we mirror our own societies, if we mirror um, societies of, of other creatures that we, we know of, we see variants in behavior, massive variants in behavior. We see all sorts of of fantastic positive difference and we also see that particularly if we're dealing with disability we see that people don't um they don't live their lives and then overcome their disability to achieve something they live their lives with their disability and that's who they are you know mm -hmm. um, i deal with yeah. a computer game um that i i help with with a lot of the the technical writing and we were positing a, a particular future and one of the things that was immediately kind of embraced was well uh with these diseases with these illnesses with these problems we will have a technological solution you know, technological solutions <laughs> solves. We can print organs. We can print limbs. We can uh, cure this, cure that. We've solved all of that. And and you're like, yeah, but your reader hasn't. Yeah. Your reader doesn't live in a world where all of those things exactly. are solved. So if you do that, what you do immediately is you start to make it just that little bit more difficult for your reader to connect with the stories of the people that you're attempting to, to tell the stories of. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in some ways. But yeah, so I have a I major character. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I have a major character in my books. He's actually kind of everybody who reads the books loves his character. He they because he's such a day, different alien character, and he is uh, an insectoid character raised around basically humans, and he is. Uh, 
a mutation amongst his own people that would have been destroyed. But he's been raised around humans, and his whole thing is he feels like he has to adapt everything around himself to him instead of trying to or adapt himself to everything around himself instead of the other way around. Instead of sitting there saying, you know, I'd be much more comfortable sleeping in a hammock. I'm just going to make this bed work, you know, because that's what the normal is. And, you know, when other people have abilities to do things that he can't, he's like, well, that that's, you know, that, that's just the normal. I, that that's me. And, you know, I have to, I have to adapt to everything else. But when others come to him and say, dude, no, you, you don't, you can adapt your world to you. You don't always have to fit into the box. It's kind of a revelation for him. And he's just like, really? It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, um, so let, let me ask you this part uh, associated with all of that. And that is reader expectation. And we've all kind of touched on that piece. I recently wrote a book, um, believe it or not, Paranormal Romance. Uh, but I gave it to a friend of mine. Yes, I know. <laughs> what? Romance writer? Uh, anyway, I... Uh, gave it to a friend of mine who uh, uh, is very well published in that area. And she read it through and she said, I really like your book and the readers are going to hate it. And she said specifically because readers in this genre have expectations about what's going to be delivered with their characters. Mm -hmm. And you kind of touched on that when you talked about elves and dwarves and things like that, there are certain characteristics associated with species that are established norms for the readers because that's just the way everybody's done it. And while we might want to choose to deviate or to, to kind of craft this in a way, are we actually running afoul of or potentially damaging the story because we're not delivering at that level of expectation. No, no, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're fighting the megatext. Um, right. And that is, that is the technical term. So Christine Brooke Rose mm -hmm. invented the term in 1981 in Rhetorics of mm -hmm. Fantasy. Um, and it is mm -hmm. the, 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 essentially the cultural code that is established through a variety of different uh, fictional text. So, you know, you would you would get certain expectations. And the the classic example that I use in classrooms on this is the vampire, is that as soon as you put a vampire in a story, everybody goes, oh, it's this, it's this. It comes with a, a vast array of baggage. And that's really useful for a uh, for a writer because they can introduce a character quickly, easily with all these things. But if the writer wants to challenge any of those things, <laughs> then it becomes hard. Hence why we ended up with spitting arguments literally really fear spitting arguments over whether they sparkle or whether they don't sparkle and then you let it all go for about 20 minutes and then you say uh, okay people um you do realize you're all arguing about something that's fictional so it really doesn't exist and it really doesn't matter but they will much. they'll fight to the nail for what they believe and there's, there's nothing wrong books. with that there's nothing yeah. wrong with oh. that i i mean i didn't come to this genre because i saw a lot of myself mm. i didn't yeah. so i i'm purposely putting in things that i know are not according to the mega text mm. um i want people to see things in a different way i want the focus to be on something other than um perhaps what has been traditionally done now does that mean i don't have as many readers uh yep it does. It means I gotta I gotta hunt and and peck and search and look under rocks and and find my people. But they're out there because I know yeah. I'm not I'm not a single anomaly of you know that that reads science fiction but would prefer to see more of something else. Um, and the text, and you take the, a chance, yeah. You yeah, and and the text, the the like text evolves. Too, you know, the text evolves. It doesn't it doesn't stay yeah. static. The vampire yeah. of 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 Nosferatu of Bram Stoker is right. not the vampire of Twilight. It is not the vampire. <laughs> of Buffy, you know, and so on. So it does evolve. But what I well, like about this, and by the way, Alan, I love being on a panel where people are dropping mm -hmm. footnotes. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but, but, I don't know you know, how I feel about what, okay. you, what I like you, about that is this is an opportunity for an author who wants to to go against the mega text to use that as a feature, you know. And and so if we well, let's just to stick with vampires, if your vampire you know, before being turned was an Orthodox Jew and you come at him with a, with a crucifix and he goes, 
so what? So <laughs> well. No, that and, reminds and, me. And, of, I, uh, and on and on like this, you and you and you run with it, and then you start exploring it and realizing. What is life like for a formerly Orthodox Jewish vampire? How is it different? Does he not drink on the Sabbath, for example? Uh, can he drain somebody who just had pork? And on and on like this. And then it, it becomes a part of the story. Uh, and, and right then and there, you've acknowledged the megatext. And then you yeah. said, now, now let's drill down and give you more. Because you already know the story of the megatext, and 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 you've read it so many times, I'm going to take it in a different direction. And yes, there are going to be readers who will probably refer to themselves as purists, a term I would use here with derision. Mm -hmm. But other people are going to be charmed and delighted and say, ooh, you're a clever writer. Show me what you've got. <laughs> Well, well, and that's what happened with me, honestly, in this particular case. The, the, the female character was not a likable character in the romance story, and, and she told me right up front, you can't do that. You cannot make the female character for a genre that's predominantly female readers, but then I can the, the character evolves and becomes quite a likable character, and she says, well, your risk, and to your point, Shalina, I'm sure I lost some readers because they didn't want to finish the story, but yeah. those that did, and I know this from reviews because these these readers actually put this in the review that they hated that part of the book to begin with. So, it's, but the same with aliens, the same with all of them. The fact that this is a, a I mean, there a, is there is a, a a slight advantage in that obviously when you're dealing with aliens and and sort of to bring this back to our our sort of central topic when you're dealing with aliens you are inventing a culture and so mm -hmm. part of the you know part of the civilization the society of what you're inventing you know means that you're dealing with something new and different and so right. therefore the reader expectation is that it is going to have something that is new and different to it in terms of what's there um, and one of the things i i use as an exercise and it's worth doing you know at any point with with any writing group um, who, who are trying to come up with ideas in relation to alien civilizations is to turn yourself you know, reflectively and think about what are the core values of your own civilization? What are the core values of your society? And if you boil them down without going into where their religious attribution comes from, um, why don't we murder people? Now, if the answer that you get when you ask that question in a lecture to your students is, well, because someone would arrest me if I murdered anyone, <laughs> then you need to leave and, 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 and keep that person out of your room for, for quite some time. The, the, you know, the, the fundamental um, cultural values start to, to kind of percolate through. People start to think, well, we value life. You know, if you kill somebody, then they lose all those opportunities for all the things that they would do in life. You know, imagine if you lost those opportunities, then obviously that would, you know, that, that allows you to imprint and reflect your values onto, onto this other person. Even though they've made you angry, you're not going to, you know, to do something so nasty. Why don't we steal? Well, because I value my own property. So I, you know, and then what you do, as soon as you boil down into those those core bits, you then go, OK, well, now imagine a society where these things are legitimate. They're part of their standard part of their culture. What would it be like? And as soon as or you change... The not. Yeah, yeah. As, it, it, as soon as you change something, you change a small thing, then obviously that society has a different basis. And it starts to, you know, to sort of build from there in terms of, of what you're trying to, to create. And in a way, it almost goes back to the plotting versus pantsing argument in that I forget which writer said it. It's like, you know, you can create this massive backstory for your characters. You can create this massive backstory mm -hmm. for your culture, how everything in it works. One percent of it only has to end up on the page. Yeah, for the care yeah. for the readers to be interested. Oh, that's 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 going to come up in the world building panel. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it, I mean, because uh, I have these massive documents that I wrote years ago about all my major uh, races, sure. and I said, okay, this is how they evolved. This is how their society moved forward. This is what their major religions were. This is you know all these little things that how much of that is going to end up in the books? You know, it's going to come up in little tidbits and little things that they do, but it opens it up and it's there. Yeah. You're next, Lawrence, uh, you're next. And, 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 and yet, SJ, I, I agree with you that only a tiny fraction ends up on the page, but I would argue that all the other, the, the rest of the iceberg, if you will, is in your head 
and it informs your writing. It gives the writing a verisimilitude that wouldn't exist if all you had was the 1% to drop into the book. You yeah. know this stuff. You've labored with it. You've, you've dreamed it. And it's part of your authorial voice. But it is, it is also knowing what to put in and what not to. Um, oh, yeah. You know, the wall drop method, I believe, is 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 the quoted one where um, I think Lisa Tuttle mentions it in her writing science fiction and fantasy where uh, this guy basically put together this short story that was was submitted to, you know, unpublished. And then there was a an appendix of notes that was twice as long as the short story explaining the, the culture and civilization that was, you know, was being, being uh, related. And of course, you know, it, it obviously is so self immersive in terms of what's there i mean there's there's another there's another uh, sort of direction that you can take that kind of world building um when you're having to work with others having that material yeah. is yeah. priceless you know if yes. you if you're going to work with a graphic designer if you're going to work with a coder if you're going to work with a um you know a level designer or if you're going to work author. with <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> you know you, you know or a, or a filmmaker is going to come yeah. in or something else then having all of that kind of back material, it absolutely, you know, it's incredible as a resource because it means immediately that they've got a they've got a framework that they can work to, uh, and that's incredible. I create useful. wikis for every series, so that my co-authors, because I've started expanding, mm. and I have co-authors on a couple of series, so that they can say, wait, this alien mentioned in book two. Oh yeah, check the wiki. And and it's all there, uh, both individuals and racial race nodes and planets and first appeared in you know <laughs> on and on like this because I can't keep track of all that crap and and I know and I've learned the hard way that if I don't keep track of it, some reader is going to come back and say, whoa 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 whoa, way back in book two you said this. And now here we are, three books later, and they're left-handed or something. And yeah, Shalina, you've been wanting to say something. No, no. <laughs> I'm, oh, okay. I'm just nodding along and laughing. I'm just nodding along well, laughing. This is my world. <laughs> well, well, when you talk about the, the wikis and you know the supplemental material that we create when we're building these things, and you put it out there. You put it out there on a website. You put it out there on a wiki. And Alan, since you work in games, you go to the you know the Mass Effect thing of here's the game oh and now here's all this what oh what is the uh, referential material yeah all this referential material that's in the game that you can now read and sit there and say oh here's the entire culture of this this race do you need that in order to play the game do you need that in order to read the book no does it increase your enjoyment of it if you're into that thing yes. <laughs> Well, you know? it, 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 there's a balance there, and um, you know, I've I've um, dealt with players in computer games who said, "Oh, I don't read anything," and I and I've said, "Going what?" You know, I I, I put I crafted all these careful little <laughs> notes and things for you to you know to come up with. Oh, no, I'm not into reading. <laughs> I, uh, what? Uh, what? What are you doing? And there is, you know, there is a balance, and there is. Um, I, I recently wrote an article for um, uh, for Focus Magazine here in the UK where. Um, uh, one of the points that uh, they were asking about advice for writing in games, and I said, one of the things is get ready to about redundancy, and not that that's not about being sacked. That's about recognizing that when you write things, half of what you write is not going to be the thing that the player, you know, sort of engages with. They're going to pass that, and they're going to go on to something else, and they're going to pass that and go on to something else. Um, you know, and their experience is going to be varied and different uh, in terms well, of what's there. <clears throat> SJ, you kind of touched on something too. Um, I, I'm not a planner. I'm a plotter. I wrote seat of the pants or whatever you want to call it. My reference material are my word doc copies of my previous books where I've got to go back and search for the answer of, I know I did this. How did I explain it last time? So I don't contradict myself. <laughs> Ouch. Can I just yeah. say ouch? That's time you need a wiki. I'm a, I, I'm a I do answer. need a wiki. I, I don't no, have I... a wiki, but I do use Scrivener. I mean, I have a story, like a series Bible. All of my stuff live together. I have all the reference notes right at my fingertips. I can't hunt. I, I need to See, be able I... to search and find. I, I did a PhD on this exact thing and on extolling the virtues of what's called a, a macro text, you know, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a document to kind of, you know, coordinate all of this. And then the science fiction series that I write, it's pantsed. 
You know, I don't, I don't plot, I don't structure. I, I, I'm, I'm a cancer as well. Speak the truth. You know? Speak the truth. Yeah, my okay. last book, I forgot how one of the characters spoke. I forgot what his his verbal idioms were, and I'm like, oh crap! I had here to go back. The, here and comes the old like, okay, here we go. <laughs> We're at the confessional now. Here we go. So, I, so I have to tell you this: I started as a pantser. And then I went, I, I climbed the mountain, as I like to say, Walter John Williams, Hugo Award winning, brilliant author, Mr. Plot, does a master course uh, up on top of a mountain in New Mexico, uh, where, where you suffer altitude sickness for the first week. And I learned amazing things of plotting and how to interleave plots and subplots and and it was great and it transformed me and I internalize, I mean, they do a thing called breaking a novel where you bring in a group of friends and what? you cover a wall with notes <laughs> and eight hours later, you know, every scene in your book and it's, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. And somewhere along the line, after doing this with others multiple times, I internalized the process and my last several books have, for the most part, been pantsed, where I'm simply and I and I'm using dictation software, and I'm I'm taking these walks through a park every morning, and I'm just narrating wow. the book as it occurs to me. But I'm able to do that because I've already done the hard work of learning how to be a plotter and how to outline everything internally at an unconscious level. And my my last book, the first draft, was dictated in 16 days. Wow. Nice. To produce the entire book. It's crazy. <laughs> and and but but I mean it comes full circle. So you you can do this, but it's only because you know it's the Carnegie Hall thing. You know, you don't just show up at Carnegie Hall and, and play. You you practice, 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 and you make it look easy. Yeah. But, to, but it only looks easy speak, because you know I've been at music, this for 30 years. I forgot I forgot we mentioned this and I think we've talked about this offline too, was that how music can play a part in developing language oh, yeah. and how oh, yeah. people speak to each other. And I wanted to say just a little bit about that because I, I'm also a musician. So, you know, I know mm -hmm. that you don't show up at Carnegie. You don't show up at Carnegie mm -hmm. until you're invited and you better be ready. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's the same with language. When you're working with different tones and different sounds, some of that can come out on the page just based on, like we were mentioning earlier, the civilization and the culture and the, you know, everything that's, all the building blocks that it's on top of, but also just for me as a, as a reader, I just want to see something new. I want to see mm -hmm. something different. I want to, I want to play with the readers a little bit with their sound, like how the words sound and play with them on the page. Some of my, some of my um, aliens are quite musical. Um, they have a singing, almost poetic kind of speaking pattern. And some of my characters are deaf. They don't have any sound uh, in their world. And they go through their life using um, gestures and things like that. So it just kind of depends. But I, I just thought it's an interesting point to note that that music can also play a huge part in, in developing a culture, developing language. That's all. No, absolutely. I know it's a little bit off, but well, but also, isn't there a certain structure to music that kind of assists with, you know, that parallelism? Yeah, there's bass eight and there's four by four, three by four. You know, if you're music, we use different language for that. But it's, yeah, it can definitely come through. Well, and I love and that. We're engineers. We have a different language. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I agree with you. We need to get together so that we can, like, find that perfect match between linguistics and engineering. Well, no, I mean, we, like... can, we can't allow that to happen. <laughs> Come on, Lawrence. We can be flexible. We can be flexible. Yeah. Well, there, we're there is this wonderful set of, of, of brain studies where, where they took um, non-musicians and they wire them up and they see where, when they play, play the music, what part of the brain is activated and particularly what hemisphere. And as people become professional musicians, they start processing music on the same side as language. Yeah, and you go, ooh, there's something there. <laughs> well, it's, uh, and to throw that back to SJ and I, uh, I'm not sure about SJ, but as an engineer, I actually visualize, I have a visualization capability of being able to think in three dimensions and, and see how things work and, and interact and things, which helps on the other part about this. In fact, uh, we have a realistic design track tomorrow about how we create these alien, you know, uh, sci-fi 
pieces. But uh, anyway, we're in the last five minutes. Um, I'd like to give everybody at least a few minutes to get a last word in. Uh, Lawrence, you want to start? No, but I guess I have to. Um, <laughs> that, that's very ill-defined there, CW. Um, go, read, 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 read. Uh, and if possible, read my books. Um, you can find me at lawrencemshone.com. And if you just sign up for my mailing list, I will send you free books because I care. You're a nice guy. Wow, I am so generous. When I'm not being a total dick, I'm a real nice guy. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. y'all jokers are gonna have to pay for mine. But no, I, I but you're still welcome. You're still welcome. The I'm first new. one I'm is new. the first one is free. <laughs> yeah. I'm you new. know. I don't have that That's many. Like you drug that dealers have taught us nothing else. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just getting started. I keep telling everybody I'm just getting started. My feet are just on the ground. I just started running. But you're welcome to come hang out with, with me. My website is tsvalman.com just like it's, you know, displayed here. This is my, the first book in my sci-fi series. Mm -hmm. My hubby did that cover. Thank you, sweetie. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoyed myself here and I hope to see you all in the discord because we will keep chatting if you want to keep chatting. Absolutely. Alan? Uh, how can I top that? Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Here you go. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, that way, that way, that way, and I, I've got a, I've got a model of that spaceship, which, uh, which I, I made a working model after, no, well, <laughs> you know, no, not, not quite, but I, I made after, um, after they, they did the cover. So actually, uh, I looked at the spaceship and then I, I, I made a model of it, and um, uh, it, it, people thought it was three D printed, but it was actually it was cardboard and tape and you know and everything else, which was nice. really cool. Um, yeah, you can you can find me in the Discord. AlanStroud.com gets to me, or BSFA.co.uk gets to me. Um, and uh, I, one one writing tip, reading tip: you don't have to explain everything. You really don't. SJ, uh, I'm gonna really second everything everybody said. Uh, <laughs> read it. Read as much as possible. See what else out, is out there. What works for you? What works for other readers? Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. See what clicks with you and such. Um, like Alan, uh, my, I, I actually design all my ships. And when we get to the realistic design thing, I'll be breaking out the models. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're 3D printed. I'm an engineer. I'm a dork. <laughs> but um, on tape, you know, unfortunately, right. <laughs> right now, you can't find my books. Uh, they actually have been pulled down and waiting for the relaunch starting this September. Spiralwar.com is up, but it is going to be redesigned in the coming months as well. So, but I look forward to interfacing with everybody and just having a good time. I can be found on Facebook, SJ Shower, or the Spiral War group on Facebook, and look forward to talking to everybody. Awesome. I'm uh, CW Lamb, uh, CW Lamb.com. That's because Charles Lamb is an 18th century English author. And uh, yeah, yes, he, yes never, he is. <laughs> <laughs> but he never wrote science fiction. You know how many times I've had to explain that to Amazon that no, he did not write these books. Please, please put them on my site. Um, uh, I actually designed the cover models for my book covers as well. Uh, uh, I did sketch up 3D models and then sent them off to my cover artist to make them look actually really nice. Um, I agree with everybody. Please uh, read, uh, be diverse, um, you know, expand your horizons, look different, uh, different genres. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not sure how much of uh, everybody here categorically jumps from bit to bit or if everybody's, you know, kind of in a uh, focused, uh, intense, but but I, I kind of like to spread it around a little bit, get my elves and my aliens and my uh, ghost stories all uh, spread around there. Well, thank you, everybody. I, uh, I really enjoyed this as well. Yeah, it's been a fascinating panel. Hopefully people have uh, enjoyed listening to it. I've, I've learned so much from you, thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Likewise. I want a copy of your dissertation now. <laughs> oh, you can get you can get it online. It is nine hundred pages. Um, I will I will send you. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it those are A four pages, right? You know, so, yeah. yeah. So they're it's even longer. Yeah. 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 yeah Eleven point five. I'll, I'll put the link up for you. You can um, you can have a read. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank hey, you. If you like that panel and you're looking to continue your author journey, or if you're just looking for a group of like minded people, all striving to improve their crafts and grow as authors, our community at KSM might just be what you're looking for. For some reading, writing, and everything in between, come on over and join us at Keystroke Medium. 